For more MTG resources and articles, check out paperchampion.net. This is Tao Chow with MTG Forge, and today we're going to be talking about 8-Rack. Now, 8-Rack revolves around the card The Rack. So let's take a look there. As the rack enters the battlefield, choose an opponent. So obviously you choose your one opponent. At the beginning of the chosen player's upkeep, the rack deals X damage to that player, where X is 3 minus the number of cards in his or her hand. So what we want to do is put the rack down and then have our opponent be empty-handed so that they will get 3 damage, uh, or at least have less than 3 cards, so they'll start taking damage every turn from the rack. Now, the reason why it's called 8-Rack is because we also run Shrieking Affliction, which is basically another version of the rack. Um, Shrieking Affliction is at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if that player has one or fewer cards in hand, he or she loses three life. So it's not exactly the same as the rack, and there's actually a key difference. Uh, one of the key differences is that Shrieking Affliction is an enchantment, and the rack is an artifact. So if they have artifact removal, you have Shrieking Affliction that you can still use, and if they have enchantment removal, then you have the rack. Now, some decks have both of those types of removal, uh, in which case you're you know kind of stuck, but the fact that you have eight of them is actually pretty good. Now, what we seek to do then is to play a whole bunch of discard uh, cards that basically force our opponent to be empty-handed or force them to play their spells or just basically lose them to, to our card discard engine. Luckily for us, we have a ton of great uh, discard. Now, before I start talking about discard, I just want to talk about discard versus mill. Now, a lot of people really, really hate Mill um, because they feel like it's affecting their game. But Mill doesn't really affect your game because the cards in your library never really get to your hand, and so it doesn't actually stop you from playing. Discard is way worse because it, what it does is it takes cards out of your hand and destroys your card advantage, and that way you can't ever play anything. Um, so it, I'd say actually Discard is actually way worse than Mill. Uh, nonetheless, uh, let's go through our Discard uh out outlet here. So we start off with blackmail. Target player reveals three cards from his or her hand and you choose one of them. That player discards that card. Now often this is uh, an easy turn one play because it's one mana, but if we can we usually like to hold on to it until they have only three or four cards left. Otherwise they're just going to show us their junk cards or the cards that they just can't really play yet um, and basically that's going to, you know, it's not going to be as valuable. Earlier on we want to play duress or inquisition of Kozilek. So target opponent reveals his or her hand, you choose a non-creature non-land card from it, that player discards the card. Inquisition of Kozilek is very similar. Uh, basically you choose a non-land card with converted mass, mana cost three or less. All right, so those are our turn one plays. Uh, also Raven's Crime. So target player discards a card. Now the cool thing about Raven's Crime is that you can use retrace on it. So what that means is that you can basically keep casting it from your graveyard as long as you uh, discard a land from your hand. Now typically we want to have only about three or four lands in play and that gives us a ton of other lands that we can keep discarding. All right, so after that we have Smallpox. So Smallpox is part of our protection package in addition to the discard outlet. So each player loses one life, discards a card, sacrifices a creature, then sacrifices a land. Now, one of the key things is that if you're going to play a creature and smallpox in the same turn, make sure you play smallpox first, right? Because otherwise you're going to have to sacrifice your creature as soon as you put it out. I made this mistake in one of my matches, as you'll see, but uh, it worked out in my favor nonetheless. Uh, I managed to get around it, but it was just kind of a stupid play. Uh, so anyways, but what you can, what this can do is it can destroy Bogles, for instance, if your players, uh, if your opponent is playing Bogles, uh, because you're not targeting the creature, they have to sacrifice it. So it's a good way to get rid of a Bogle, but also a good way to get rid of a threat or a singular threat anyways. Um, let's see, we also have Wrench Mine, so target player discards two cards, and this he or she discards an artifact. Now most cards don't run a ton of artifacts, um, uh, most decks don't run a ton of artifacts, but some do, uh, in which case this, this card might not be that good, but nonetheless, um, it's actually a pretty good card most of the time. Uh, stupor, 
So target opponent discards a card at random, then discards a card. Now, you'd think that this would sound a lot like um, Wrench Mind, because it causes the person to discard two cards. But the discard at random is actually really devastating, uh, because basically you can't control which one is coming out of your hand in that case. And, you know, if they have a combo piece, they could choose to discard other things that aren't those combo pieces. But uh, sometimes, and it seems like always the worst time, Stupor will get rid of the card that you really need. So, anyways, discarding at random is something people really, really don't like. Okay, now, after that, we have some protection. Okay, so we have Ensnaring Bridge. Um, basically, creatures with power greater than the number of cards in your hand can't attack. We're rarely ever going to have a ton of cards in our hand because our mana cost is so low. So, Ensnaring Bridge is really going to help to protect us. Let's see, we have Victim of Night. So, destroy target non-vampire, non-werewolf, non-zombie creature. This works for almost every deck. It's only two mana to get rid of basically anything if you were really worried about it though like fighting a lot of vampires or zombies or whatever uh, then you could replace it with murder or hero's downfall or anything like that to get rid of uh, get rid of those are a little more expensive but uh, i mean in the terms of mana cost but they'll do the job just as well Right, uh, we have Augur of Skulls. Now, Augur of Skulls is kind of a 1 1 beater, but he can be, uh, he's not really a beater, just a 1 1 chump blocker, but you can also sacrifice him on your upkeep. So remember though, if you're playing online, you have to set a stop on your upkeep to do this. Uh, you can't really do it any other time, right? So, um, yeah, Augur of Skulls, uh, player sacrifices two cards and you can just sit him onto the battlefield and just wait until your opponent has two cards in hand and then uh, sack him to cause that cause him to discard those two cards now i also th just happen to have these because of my torpor orb deck um, the hunted orb deck that i made earlier uh, dark confidant so at the beginning of your upkeep reveal the top card of your library put that card into your hand you lose life equal to its converted mana cost now, one of the things in this deck is that, you know, we don't want to run out of gas. So if our opponent can keep drawing cards and we run out of discard outlet cards, then it's going to make things very difficult for us. So what we want is Dark Confidant to help us uh, to keep drawing cards, and that way we can just keep uh, keep milling our, not milling, discarding our opponent. So that's pretty much how we're going to keep our opponent empty-handed and deliver damage to them turn after turn for the win. So let's take a look at the mana situation. So what we have is two Dakmore Salvage. Now we're not playing four of them because they come into the battlefield tapped, but we still like to have some in the deck just in case. Now the reason why they're good is because instead of uh, drawing a card, what we can do is we can dredge for this card. Meaning that instead of drawing a card, we can put two cards from the top of our library into the graveyard, and then we can put this card in our hand. Meaning we can basically take it back and make sure we're going to get a land in our hand. Now, why do you care about that? Well, the reason why is because Raven's Crime has a retrace ability. So what we can do is once we play our Raven's Crime, it's going to be in the graveyard, and then we can retrace it, so recast it by paying its one mana, but all we also have to discard a land. Well, if we happen to have Dakmar Salvage, we can discard the Dakmar Salvage, and then that'll be in the in the graveyard. And then the next turn, we can dredge it back. And then Raven cry, Raven's Crime our opponent over and over again using this combo with Dakmore Salvage. All right, so that way, if our opponent doesn't play any cards in his turn, then we can use the uh, Raven's Crime ability to just keep him empty-handed turn after turn, which basically forces our opponent uh, to play their cards, even if they're not valuable at the time. Now, we're running a little bit of white. Okay, it's just going to be kind of weird because all of our cards are black. Uh, the main reason, as you'll see, is actually just for sideboarding. Okay, so we're running uh, four of Godless Shrines. So the reason why I like Godless Shrines is because it's a pain land. It's not, that's not really why I like it, but it can, it can come into the battlefield untapped if we really need it to. Right now, I don't really like it that much, but it's kind of like we do need access to fast mana. Um, and it doesn't really pair well with Dark Confidant because it also hurts us. But if you need to get that mana online, then it's a good one to have. Okay, Isolated Chapel are running also a four of. Now, Isolated Chapel is pretty much going to come into the battlefield untapped un unless you're just super unlucky. Mainly because God the Shrine is also a Plains and a Swamp, and we're also playing uh, 11 Swamps. All right, so uh, that's going to give us some access to some white mana, which is really going to help. Now, let's go over to the sideboard and you can see why I'm using white mana. Now, pretty much the only reason why I'm using white mana is because of Leyline of Sanctity. 
Okay, so when we're playing, especially because this is going to be competing against a lot of the more competitive decks, then opponents, especially any opponent that's going to play white, will probably have Leyline of Sanctity either in their main deck or at least in their sideboard. So Leyline of Sanctity makes it so a lot of these cards like just basically don't affect them. So let's take a look. Anything that targets your opponent. So target player, that doesn't work. Okay, target player, that's not going to work. Target opponent, that's not going to work. Target player, okay, uh, that's gonna, that's okay. Um, target player discards two cards. That okay. Each player. Okay, this one would uh, so smallpox would work. Uh, Victim of night would work. Wrench mind would not work, and stupor also does not work. Okay, so basically, if your opponent gives himself hexproof, you just can't be the target. It can't be a target of any of your abilities, and you're just wrecked. Right, so it makes things a little bit difficult if your opponent can start with a ley line of sanctity. So the reason why we have a little bit of white mana here is actually just for fragmentize. Okay, so fragmentize destroy target artifact or enchantment with converted mana cost four or less. That's ley line of sanctity, and it only costs one to cast this out. Thanks, Kaladesh. All right. The other cards we're having our sideboard are Languish. Okay, so all creatures get minus four, minus four till end of turn. That's to take care of like token strategies or maybe some of the fast aggro that might come out. Uh, Spellskite deals with burn and bogles pretty well. Um, Pithing Needle to turn off planeswalkers and other effects, maybe even Lantern of Control. Right, and um, Nile Spellbomb is basically to take care of things like Dredge or anything like, like Snapcasters and whatever that are returning things and bringing stuff back from the graveyard. Okay. Now, it's important to talk about some upgrades here or ways that we could vary this deck. Now, one thing you can do is use Funeral Charm. So Funeral Charm is a nice uh, addition here. I'll see if actually I have one. Okay, so I guess I do have one here. Let's see, take a look at it here. So target player discards a card, so it's again one mana discard. Target creature gets plus two minus one till end of turn, or target creature gains Swamp Walk. We're pretty much never going to do that, um, mainly because we don't really have any creatures except for Augur of Skulls and Dark Confidant, but we're never really attacking with those. So you can either give a target creature plus two minus one, which can get rid of a pesky creature, or we can choose uh, get our opponent to discard a card. So that's one option. Another one, which I'm pretty sure we I don't have, is Necrogen Mists. Okay, so Necrogen Mist is basically an enchantment that sits on the battlefield and says at the beginning of each uh, player's upkeep, they have to discard a card. So what that means for you is that if you don't play your card on your after you draw it, you're going to have to discard it on your upkeep. So the reason why that's uh, pretty deadly, and it actually uh, affects us as well, is it's pretty deadly for our opponent though, because uh, basically they cannot hold any cards in their hand. Right? So it's just an ongoing discard outlet for them. Now, it's not really that bad for us because the converted mana cost of our cards is so low that we can pretty much cast anything we want. And you know, if all of our stuff is pretty relevant, and if it's not at the time, uh, then we probably don't need it. So it's not really going to hurt us that much. Now, the last card I wanted to add was, and I know I don't have this one, is Liliana of the Veil. Now, Liliana of the Veil is a tremendously powerful card and definitely a must-have include uh, if you have it or if you, you know, have bags of gold or, you know, sacks of money just lying around, right? Uh, she's just super powerful. Her ultimate just is really great. She can protect herself. But, you know, one Liliana of the Veil pretty much costs, like, almost as much as this entire deck. Um, maybe two of them cost this entire deck because uh, Ensnaring Bridge is pretty expensive as well. Uh, so it's up to you if you want to add Liliana, if you've got you know a whole bunch of extra funds or you want to sell your firstborn child or something like that. Uh, just kidding, don't sell your firstborn child. Um, but anyways, this is still actually a pretty competitive build. Now, one of the cool things about 8-Rack uh, is that it's very competitive, but you can also uh, you, can, you can also build it in stages, so you don't have to have everything. So, for instance, if I didn't have Dark Confidant, I could just add more Augur of Skulls, right? If I didn't uh, have, um, I don't know, any, like Ensnaring Bridge, I could splash the, use the Splash of White to use Ghostly Prison, which is actually pretty cheap right now. And I could still, you know, you can actually build this in stages and just keep uh, improving it and improving it until you get, like, the full build. So anyways, it's a fun little deck to build. Um, 
I definitely recommend playing it if you're the kind of player who makes it so who likes it if your opponent doesn't have any fun. Um, it's really a pain to play against. It really is because, uh, like, even in a counters deck, uh, your opponent just basically like has to lose a card to counter your effect, which is basically what you want them to do anyways. So. If you do like these decks, remember to like and subscribe. If there's something you think that you'd like to see in the 8-rack or another deck that you'd like to see profiled, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. It's that time again for Random Card Review, where I click a Random Card and see where it ranks on the scale from craptastic to fantastic. So let's take a look. Putrefy. Okay, so this is one uh one black and one green so total of three it's from ravnica all right uh reprinted a whole bunch of times let's take a look um destroy so three mana destroy target artifact or creature it can't be regenerated i'd say that this is actually a pretty strong card especially if you're in the right colors so three mana to destroy uh any creature or artifact that's uh, you know pretty sweet especially because black generally doesn't have artifact destruction uh, so, you know, splashing green to get artifact destruction, but also have um, almost a modality about it or, you know, an extra ability to be able to add that to a, or change that to a creature makes it pretty good. I'd, uh, I'd say this is, you know, a, a pretty decent card, especially if this is in your color. Maybe not main board, maybe sideboard, uh, just depending on what you're running. Uh, but overall, yeah, it's a good card and you can tell it's been reprinted a lot of times. Uh, that actually doesn't tell you anything about how good the card is, uh, mainly because Wizard actually reprints a whole bunch of terrible cards every time, uh, just because they're, you know, just filler that they like to reuse over and over again. So, nonetheless, I would say that this four, mana, four star rating is actually pretty good. I would even say maybe four and a half stars. It sounds like a great card to use, uh, especially if you're using this Golgari type color, so uh, green and black. Anyways, that's my random card review. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.